Are you tired of wasting your time on print-related tickets? Printer Logic offers a centralized, cloud-native, IP-based print management system. Dump your print servers and discover the future of print management with Printer Logic. Find out more and get a free 30-day trial at printerlogic.com slash packet pushers. Welcome to Heavy Strategy, where we're all about unanswered questions instead of unquestioned answers. Today, Greg and I are going to talk about the whole issue of how do you translate from geek speak to biz talk, or more exactly, how do you as a technologist effectively and influentially engage business? So let I'm me, always found sticks to be very helpful. Yeah, yeah, if no, you hit them, no, no, they sort of no, pay bad attention. Greg, bad no. Greg, bad <laughs> Greg. No sticks. No sticks. hitting the business with Farting sticks. Farting as you walk past them in the corridor to send them a message. Yeah. You know. No, I don't think that either. Um, the, you know, the, the real challenge is that in order to be effective as a technologist, you need to align your, your efforts with the business. Everybody says that, right? But how mm. do you do that? And I'll take one very simple problem. We start, we start with, and we've talked about this on the show, when you're building a strategy, a technology strategy, strategy, it should be aligned with the business strategy. Well, there's one small problem with that. What do you do when there <laughs> isn't a business strategy or at least isn't a documented business strategy? So, you know, how do you how do you start when the when the when the the thing that's in the critical path isn't there? Well, um, I, yeah, I, go ahead. Let me just interject there because I think there's a couple of things. One is a company can have a tech strategy. Like more common is to not have well, a tech strategy. Well, I'm not strategy. talking about a tech strategy. I'm talking mm. about a business strategy because yeah. to build your tech strategy, you have to have a business strategy that it aligns with. Yeah. It's plenty often that companies sort of, you know, roll forward under their own steam. And sometimes the reality is a lot of companies don't actually have a strategy or an articulated strategy. It's sort of exactly. a that's consensual, what, that's what I'm we're heading in this direction and nobody's saying no, so off we go, right? Um, that's far more common than this is our architecture, this is our strategy. Now, we've done several, well, three that's, or four well, shows that's what, I'm just, on, that's just what I just said there, yeah. there Greg, that, that 99 times out of 100, when you sit down and try to, try to start with a business strategy, there isn't one. Mm. So then what do you do? So um, we've done three or four shows, if you just – cast your mind mm-hmm. back on how to do strategy, how to do architecture, how to sustain a strategy, how to sustain an architecture. And they all start with start with a business strategy. So yeah. here we're going to zero in mm-hmm. on the fa- on what you do when there isn't a business strategy. And all here's right. what you do. What do you do? You go back and you look at the actual history of what the business has done. Okay. Basically, and let um, we're taking a for-profit business as an example, but this can be exactly the case for a not-for-profit as well or an educational institute. Mm. You can say, all right, any for-profit business is in the business of making money and making shareholders wealthy. That's kind of its job, right? But there are different ways to make money. You can say, well, they're in the business of making money by acquisition, so they're buying lots of companies. You can see this in in the rearview mirror. You can see if you if you have a history of, of buying 10 companies in the past 20 years, that is part of your strategy is growth by acquisition. Yeah. If you have never bought a company in your entire history, your strategy is growth by organic growth. So that's good. Now you mm-hmm. know the difference. Okay, one, organic or or acquisition. Mm-hmm. Then you look at the fact, look at the pace of new product introductions. Some people, some companies will simply just continue offering the same product, cut down the cost that they have for creating the product and increase the margins. So, you know, they just get organic growth and new customers, but they make more money on each widget as the years go by because they get more efficient at making widgets. Mm. Other companies will actively roll out new products on a regular basis, trying to attract new customers. And that's a whole different strategy because it requires a different marketing strategy. It requires, you know, different infrastructure. So again, you can tease out these details from what has happened. Mm. So take, take, so to answer the question very practically, take 15 or 20 minutes, look back over the history of the company and see whether you're more of an organic growth or an acquisition, whether you're more of a new customer growth or, you know, upsell to existing customers or simply reducing costs and increasing margin as selling to existing customers. You can right. figure all this out by just looking at what you did. I often talk about IT as being a productivity tool. So I can take a given process, add some IT to it, and that will accelerate the process, or it will make it more cost efficient, or it will improve the business process. So if you're in the case of insurance, you know, 200 years ago, it was, I'll write you an insurance policy and a clerk would sit down and work with you and agree a price and it would go to a review, you know, and IT obviously changes all of that. It changes it into actuarial, you know. But again, again, the question of whether you want to be more productive, more productive is 
the business it aligns with the business strategy of improved margins. Hi. If your business strategy is acquisition, you may need to focus on building an architecture that allows integration that's super modular that you can snap to any organization that you bring in and you should become extremely good at the process of integration and acquisition at the expense of maybe not being a productivity tool. You're an integration tool. Yeah. So that's kind of the point is you got to understand where Okay, so let's try and break that down world. a little bit then. So what you're saying is if you're in a stable, mature business with stable profit margins that's looking just to continue as is <clears> and wants to you know, gain profit growth because all businesses well, want to. Well, if they're right? stable profit margins, they're not going up. But no, let's say but they're, they're a stable business that's looking to increase profit profitability, margins. Profitability, right? Then yeah. you would look for ways to create efficiencies and to be to Bingo. assist that profitability, right? Exactly. So you would you know, find ways to make processes faster, find ways to communicate with customers, it. Yes. whatever it is, right, in, in, and reduce costs internally, uh, improve product performance, so forth. But the other way to do this is that you're in a company that is going to uh, buy other companies or grow or acquire new customers. They're two yeah. different strategies, and you mm. may be doing all three. So you but... need a more flexible infrastructure, which says exactly. we allow for multiple platforms. You you might be running Macs internally, and most exactly. likely and you might you buy win- a Windows company. Yes. That's right, yes. Or you know, you, you're you using certain brand of servers, and the other companies that you buy have some other brand. It's highly unlikely you'll get to throw all the servers out. You're going to have to be and flexible. All of your contracts should have merger, acquisition, yeah. and divestiture causes and clauses in there that mm. allow you to make changes upon acquiring another company. That kind mm. of thing. Yes. That kind of thing, right? Exactly. So there's a handful of things to look at, and I've highlighted a few. You know, mm. are you foc- is your company largely focused on improving margins? Is it largely focused on buying other companies? Is it largely focused on organic growth? Is it largely mm. focused on growth by new product development? Yeah. All of them have implications for IT. So look at that. And figure understand. Out. I think, yeah. Yeah. Mm. And then go back and look at the, you know, financial, uh, look at the financial returns that your company is posting to see what they stress. You don't necessarily believe all the gobbledygook, but if they start talking about how we've had a great run of growth by, you know, we acquired 15 companies, that's kind of a clue. <laughs> so see what they stress in those. And yeah. that will allow you to get basically the key pieces. Oh, one last thing I want to highlight is a lot of companies talk about increasing market share and increasing competitiveness. That actually, that is a specific flag for IT folks as well, because Mm. that means new product growth, almost, almost, it, you, there's no way you're going to increase competitiveness by not have without having new products because you have to outcompete your competitors by having better stuff, and it also means that you really want to focus on cheaper stuff. So you you're trying to do better, cheaper, and possibly faster. Mm-hmm. So just think about all these pieces and how they how they apply because faster, for example, means that you need greater agility in IT. You can't be the guy or gal standing there saying, I'm sorry, line of business, we can't offer that new product because it's going to take 18 months to do the IT infrastructure to make it happen. Yeah. You'll be looking for another job. But the other so, way to say it is I would say, mm-hmm. look, this strategy that you're following necess- necessarily means you're going to incur higher costs. We need right. more headcount. You're going to be bringing together multiple teams, of diverse products that are going to be very difficult to support at a cost-effective manner, and you're going to need to accept that because we're not going to be able to rationalize down to supporting, you know, we're going to have to try and find a way to support diverse physical and software infrastructures. I've got to merge two accounting teams. I've got to merge two sales platforms, you know, quite exactly. often. You know. Exactly. And also, and also, Greg, you highlighted something that's really important, which mm. is if your strategy is growth, there's a strategy that says profitability over growth, and there's a strategy that says growth over profitability. If your strategy is growth over profitability, you do want to staff up. If yeah. your strategy is profitability over growth, you don't. And in fact, when you talk about the tech debacle and everybody laying off these tech, mm. you know, tech companies laying folks off, the real reason they're doing it, the mm. heart of why they're doing it is because it used to be growth until, you know, until last summer. It was growth over profitability mm. because interest rates were flat. Now that interest rates are rising, growth is not that big a deal because you can actually get a return on investment of your capital in other fashions. You don't have to find some tech company that claims it's going to grow 500 percent in two years. Mm-hmm. And so all of a sudden, all those people became redundant because growth wasn't as important anymore. That's the way you have to think about it. Yeah. Let's pause the conversation for a word from sponsor Printer Logic. Remember how the future was going to be paperless? Yeah, not so much. And where there's paper, there's printers and print servers. 
If you're tired of dealing with print-related tickets, PrinterLogic offers a simple, scalable, cloud-native, centralized, direct IP printing platform. Connect your print environment to easily manage front and back-end printing, integrate with EMR and ERP solutions, and get visibility and security. Say goodbye to print servers and reduce print tickets by up to 90% with PrinterLogic. Find out more and get a free 30-day trial at printerlogic.com slash packetpushers. That's printerlogic.com slash packetpushers. And now back to the podcast. There's research coming out this week showing that perhaps as much as 30% of jobs advertised are actually companies not serious about filling them because they just want to tell the existing staff we're advertising the job. Just keep working harder. Well, I thought uh, was- that... That could be. I'm yeah. not sure how anyone would actually. Uh, as a, a researcher, yeah. I'm really, really, really skeptical that yeah. people have. I'll see if any... I can dig up the link for you. But I read it and I was like, "Ha! Huh, I would never have thought that that would be that high." I would say five percent. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm super skeptical of the research. Let me just put it that way. I think there might have been some qualifications around, you know. Yeah, which, which basically is BS because yeah. it just, it just means, hey, watch out, your company is is unscrupulous and trying to, you know, yeah. trying to rattle your cage, which I think anyone that listens yeah. to this knows that's the case. <laughs> that's right. Anyway, but I just thought I'd mention that because it's just something that I found out this week. And I'd never considered that, you know. Yes, we're advertising. Yes, we've got... We've I got would a, suspect it's terrible. not that high quite simply because it's super expensive to hire people. Apparently that's you right know. now. I, don't, I think it's yeah. super high because yeah. nobody's employing or something like that. Right. So, yeah. But anyway, coming back from all of this, the, the, whole, the whole issue is... If you don't have a business strategy, you have to, you, you don't, nobody's handing it to you, so you have to reverse engineer it. Hmm. And you can, you're more than welcome to take it to business leaders and say, hey, this is what I think our strategy is, and have them tell you no. But if you've done it the right way, you can point to the reasons you're saying that. But that, enough about that. Once you do that, you're off to the races. You can build your technology strategy and architecture and all that good stuff based on the business strategy that you have reverse divined from the tea leaves. <laughs> let's put it that way. Hmm. But then the next step is how do you how do you organize communicating with the business? And way too often, I think the single biggest mistake that I see people making is treating the business as end users. Mm. So in other words, they have a request. We go do it. Mm. Um, they're not happy. We make them happy. And so that means that puts you in the position of almost being a nursemaid. You know, oh, my user interface sucks. Can you make it better? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to make your user interface better. Mm. You really need to be having conversations with the business leaders, um, the head of sales, the head of legal, the head of uh, HR to understand what their top initiatives are, what their pain points are, not as humans. You know, the head of sales says, well, my phone doesn't work the way I want it to. Who cares? We don't care about that right now. <laughs> we want to know. You know, what is stopping your salespeople from closing business in the field? Yeah. Like, why are why does it take 30 days to close a sale? Yeah. What's what's causing keeping that? You know, is there anything IT could be doing that could enable that sale to be closed in 15 days, which would make life better all around? That yeah. kind of thing. And those yeah. conversations could we have to speed happen? up the process of contract exactly. generation. Exactly. Could we speed exactly. up? purchase order handling could we yeah those types of yeah, issues exactly yeah. exactly but the problem is the head of sales may not be used to talking to the cio or the cto in that fashion because they're thinking of you as the techie in the corner yeah. and your job is to make their phone work so it's a bit of a challenge to get those conversations but it turns out it's like any other political challenge inside a large organization there are ways yeah. to make it work um well i think great. i think you're getting into yeah. the area of my metaphor of if you ask a stupid question you'll get a stupid answer so if you ask the chief sales grunt mm -hmm. i call them grunts because they rarely can communicate effectively except when they're running down a sales pitch um that's a generalization but i'm fairly hostile to sales people in general um is if you say to them what can you do they'll answer you from a personal point and they'll talk to you about their phone their car mm -hmm. you know the the charge right. card for getting for fuel free fuel and all that sort of stuff and whereas what you need to say is you know organizationally what are the issues you've got to ask smart questions when you're interviewing or, uh, I completely agree with that I would also <clears throat> say if you're the CIO or the CTO you want to you want to take a couple people you trust and then we'll get to that in, mm -hmm. in the next section a couple people you trust and send them on a run with the salespeople uh, as observers you know sometimes sometimes in cities they have people observing the police force seeing what they're doing you know, go and see what it, what the day to day life is like for the people who are doing their jobs you know see what HR is doing see what finance is doing Watch from the standpoint of, hey, can I make this better, faster, cheaper, in alignment with the business strategy we talked about previously? But the gotcha there is um, you probably hired a bunch of technical people, not people who are great at 
watching and observing and listening and asking intelligent questions. Or having emotional intelligence or being exactly. empathetic. Cause exactly. Because those sorts of, if you've got emotional intelligence and empathy, you probably aren't in the technology stack. Exactly. Your feelings got hurt way back on your first job when somebody told you your your, your code stinks. <laughs> and you went, I can't handle this feedback. Yeah, it's I'm much go more do likely. Something. But you can learn. Um, I had to train myself to do that, but I was self-employed. And yeah. I found that learning some sort of emotional intelligence and situational awareness and how to tell the business people to um, uh, there's a joke you know it's like uh, I look forward to telling people to bugger off in such a way as they look forward to the trip so <laughs> yeah. right so you know um, it's a polite way of saying exactly what you're thinking but you sort of find ways to I actually developed a whole language which I call corporate uh, corpo babble or consulto babble. So if I'm hired as a consultant, I have a whole language pattern about the dynamic value of finding vectors for improvement inside the business where we look for opportunities where we can accelerate the the speed of operation of the value that, the, that we can drive out of the equations inside of the core proposition of what we do to generate profits for the organization. Wouldn't you agree? And and by the way, folks who are listening, I am watching Greg's face as he does this, and he's got the look in his eyes is hilarious because it's super, super innocent, but with this overlay of absolute mischief, like, you know, and I know I'm saying bullshit, but it's what you want to hear, right? Yeah, Did right. I do a good job? And the weird part about it is that that, that consulto babble works amazingly well to to... Uh, get business people work like that 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 sort of psycho babble or double babble um comes from business people so if you have the misfortune like I do in this podcasting game to meet with senior executives they're often got minds on other things and even when you're communicating with them they just they talk like this right and it's meaningless it's like if you ever I know that's to... that's the thing I could I could never do that which ex explains a lot of things because it's like <laughs> what the hell is a vector in this category in the, you know I know what it is mathematically but vector yeah. are yeah, you I know. kidding it me? has no meaning I know but all of a sudden you start speaking this 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 language that they sort of they hear patterns and words and they start to engage you as a business person and that's just rubbish right it's trash there's no meaning in what i just said at all it doesn't even uh, go yeah, in a particular it, it direction it absolutely doesn't but, but um, um but yeah I the other thing weird, and I, but... I don't want to circle back to something in case yeah. you're as intimidated by corporal corpo babble <laughs> as i am mm. um the single biggest non-technical thing skill i ever learned in my life was how to ask questions yeah um and very specifically the why and how questions are really good. And I will highlight again, I think I probably mentioned this, but the five whys is huge. Gee, Mr. Salesperson, why do you do it that way? Well, because the application only works, you know, mm. Monday through Friday. And I have to, you know, and I work a lot on Saturday. Why is it that the application only works Monday through Friday? Uh, well, because we said blah, blah, blah. And keep going. Mm -hmm. And usually it takes five whys to come to the core of why something oh, really is. I, I tend to lean out of whys. I tend to rotate around through the how, what, when, where, why. So, yeah. you know. But they're, does, all, but they're yeah. all good questions yeah. to ask. Mm -hmm. I mean, basically the, the net net is your the team that you send on these missions needs to be very good at asking questions. Mm. I would say you don't need to be good at corporal babble because you're not supposed to talk. You're supposed to listen as much as possible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then who's that team? And that gets to the whole notion of a business liaison. Mm -hmm. um, these are the people that should be interacting. And here's the catch. People think of business liaisons as business analysts. They sort of sit in the corner. Yeah. The business says, write me some code and I'm, make it do mm -hmm. this. And the business analyst says, yep, and does that. Well, right? You know, there's That's also not a useful what we're talking about. There's also That's a useful... Not, well, let, 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 me, let me finish sure, the sure, definition sure, sure, of sure. a business liaison and then, then we'll talk about the useful thing. Yeah. You know, the whole idea of a business liaison is that they are relatively senior within your organization and their job is not to reactively respond to the needs of business. Their job is to understand the strategy of business and communicate the IT strategy in that context back to the business. So they're not going to sit around and write code. They're going to go on these trips, come back with the information, propose architectures, Run the run the process of of having say a proof of concept so that the business can start to feel the benefits that you're deploying. So that's the point: is mm. that the business liaisons are much more senior. Now you were saying something, Greg. I like to uh, paint word pictures. 
you know, I like to think of um, senior business executives as kindergarten children. And I like to talk in short words and say, like, so, friend, if I helped you put it together a picture or a vision of where this is how you talk to kids at three years old, by the way. Right. And you, you say to them, if I was to paint you a vision of possibility, we could uh, say that your department's performance could be helped or assisted by us by going through this process of enhancing your corporate capabilities. We could delve into this process and deliver some automation to accelerate your transformation. The problem with that, Greg, Mm. is I'm going to put my senior executive hat on. Mm. Uh, I was very well managed by someone that reported to me who figured out very quickly that doing all that would be a waste of his breath. And Mm. I have a good imagination. My problem is I don't you know, I didn't trust he could do what he was talking about. So what he did, and this is something you may have to do, and I mentioned proof of concept mm-hmm. a minute ago, just go freaking build it. Like, mm. understand what the problem is, go find a couple of vendors, put it together in your lab, and then lead, lead the five-year-old child by the hand into the lab and so say, I'm coming back to Here's earlier in works. the cycle, is to paint I'm just a vision saying, of No, no, I'd say don't even bother. Mm. Don't paint the word pictures, don't tell them the story, mm. build the thing, bring them in, show them the thing, and then see what their feedback is. So you're is. suggesting and a fast prototype capability. Exactly, exactly. Which can work for would, a lot of stuff, but not for everything. Not everything. Yeah, you yeah. can't no, say, I'm listen, we're focused gonna... in the in the in the discussion when you're face to face with the with the executive who's often got a lot on their minds and they've got a personal life. And I think the only time yeah. you need to do that is when you have to get funding to do the prototype. Otherwise, mm. just freaking build it and show them because yeah. it's a waste of your, your breath and it's a waste of their time because they they either can't imagine it or they don't trust you. And this you. is why Excel's so powerful. So often yes, exactly. used for these things because you can just use Excel's extract data, do an ETL from a database, generate exactly. a report, and they go, that's exactly what I want. Don't change anything. And, right. you know, yeah. or, or more yeah. likely what they do is, wow, you can do that? Well, wait a minute. It yeah. would be nice if you did. In fact, I just did this last night. My, mm. uh, you know, We were using a new tool for something and my colleague, and, you know, very proudly showed me showed me what he had. And I was like, oh, my God, that's awesome. OK, can you make all these changes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Fortunately, there were very simple changes. So I just looked yeah. in the morning you and they're, they're, they're prototype there, something in Excel and then it turns into the actual yeah. live business tool, which is that's yeah, a you don't want to right do that. Then. But but for Excel aside, again, mm-hmm. the, the, the point here is uh, that you really want you want these business liaisons that they're that they exist at a much higher level and they need to understand that they're going to be undervalued. They're going to be condescended to. They're going to be talked down to. And they may have insecurities of their own mm. because what kind of human do you want in this function? Well, you want somebody who understands technology but is more motivated by making something work than they are about being the most knowledgeable about technology. And that's not everybody in your in your team. Mm. And they also have to have good communications ability and good ability to ask questions, which, as we said at the beginning, if they're that good, they probably didn't want to go into IT. <laughs> so yeah. your best bet at growing these people mm. is getting a certain kind of technical grad, you know, somebody who has an engineering degree, but is, you know, as people told me, they said, look, we know you were more, you were better suited to be a consultant because you document too much of your code. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that kind of person I, leaps out. If you're I trying to make your liked, code useful. Um, I always liked employing mid twenty women, mostly mm-hmm. mid-20s and getting them to do the communication because I often found yeah, the, they the were... Pro- ex- the problem with that, though, yeah. I'll circle back to my main mm. point, is those people are going to get condescended to. Women will get condescended yeah. to more than men. Young people will get condescended to more than mm. older people. And heaven forfend you hire people of color who are going to get condescended to on three different axes. When you're in your 20s, that's actually hard. So it's a very, very tough job because, because yeah. what happens is you then start internalizing your treatment as yeah. just a no, secretary. I say to say to them yeah. like you know there, there are ways to work through that and say things like you're not a, you, this is an unwinnable situation but we're going to give it a go or things like that so yeah um, i mean you, you I have would, to manage to it is the but point equally the young the young people are very good mm-hmm. at uh, tilting at windmills because they don't know that you can't right exactly Whereas if you send in a someone you know someone who's in their mid 50s who knows the people involved and have been in the company forever and have lost the motivation or the will to live you know and survive, exactly you or know. when they come in and try to paint those word pictures if that's the direction you're going they don't yeah. believe in their own word pictures and that comes through no, and that because becomes they know a problem. they're going to get the, the yeah, executives exactly. are gonna, so you do have so to create a change agent you do have to be that is a problem too of course is that a lot of companies just aren't interested in changing 
So well, yeah, but that's that's why I wouldn't. Mm. Uh, whoops, sorry. I, I wouldn't bother calling them change agents because mm. to me that's another one of those corporal babble nothingness. <laughs> Um, you know, that's why they're business. Yeah, that's why they're business liaisons. Because honestly, if you say I am sending my change agent to you, I'm like, I don't want to change. So go away. (laughs) Send them right back. Right. Uh, The another thing that you'll have to deal with as a manager is the control of uh, control of information. A lot of times the business units and the, you know, operational units don't actually want to share their day to day business with you, the IT department, because Information is the coin of the realm in corporate politics. Mm -hmm. If you have it, if you give it to certain people, you don't give it to other people, that's how you win. And they're looking at you as, you know, the janitor or something. Why would you give this person all this valuable information when they can't do anything for you Mm -hmm. is the mindset. So you have to you have to work around that. It is, And there is a certain amount of intelligence involved here in terms of and it is probably a learned skill, learned by doing skill. You can't teach this in a classroom, really. You have to have some sort of knowledge of the business, which is something that's only learned on the job. You have to understand that the people on the other side of this are doing tasks. But uh, one of the key learnings that I would give you is that most senior executives spend more time looking upwards than they do downwards. Right? At least the good ones do. Yeah, because that's what they're, that, yeah. uh, that tends that's to goal. align with. Their, their goal is to move upwards or yeah. their goal is to make sure their boss isn't giving them a heart. You know, they're not failing their bosses. Looking downwards to you is less interesting or less useful and generally as a, as a broad generalization. It, it, exactly. Yeah. And and the, the you know two two comments I think of these 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 people as centaurs they're sort of half one and half the other mm. they're half techie and half communicators which is they become wonderful architects and if you can look for people with who are fascinated by systems like systems are systems engineering like a young grad system engineering grad would be the perfect person for this because mm-hmm. because here's what you dangle in front of them you say hey you're going to learn how the business really works. And they think of the business as a giant system. And frankly, a lot of businesses are absolutely fascinating. I remember the first time I understood. (laughs) I remember the first time I understood what a pharmaceutical logistics business really did. And I'm like, oh, my word, that's really interesting. (laughs) It's useless. I mean, it's not, you know, has it. it, it, But it's really fun. And if you have a passion for that. The most interesting company I worked for was a retail bank. Yes. That is without doubt the most tedious and dull business that I was but merchant banking endlessly interesting uh, financial well, that, banking like you know that's uh, why retail banks all wanted to get into the investment business because yeah. remember I mean remember back in the 50s like being banking being a banker was supposed to be a comfortable but boring mm. job yeah. <laughs> right these days I think it's a little bit too uncomfortable and exciting because <laughs> we keep having to bail you out which means you're not doing a very good job but that's yeah. neither here nor there neither here nor there it's not our problem that's, right. uh, that's an SCP someone else's problem <laughs> Mm-hmm. Exactly. So, you know, there's a and there's a lot of challenges that you and your team of business liaisons will face. Um, we talked about a lot of these, but there's also the airplane reading syndrome, especially as you're talking to the senior execs. They want something because they read about it in the, in the you in know, on the plane magazine. trip. Yeah. Or especially these days, they tell you what technology they want, not what they want to have accomplished because they're pretty technical. They I, think think. There's a, I think there's a job opportunity there for a company like Packet Pushes to do an in-flight magazine. We could influence so much money. <laughs> yeah, but we'd probably have to pay the airlines so much money just to get positioned there. I that, don't know. Yeah, I think they'd it. be happy to get rid of it. <laughs> so, you no, know. unfortunately, uh, airlines like to make money on absolutely yeah, everything, everything other yeah. because they can't make money on airplane tickets. So there's a small problem yeah, with I their know, business like, model. Yeah, but You'd think they'd have worked it out, but no. But yeah. And then I think the last thing I want to highlight, because I know we're sort of zeroing in on the close, mm. that you know one of the big challenges is that the business – Generally, there aren't lots and lots of business visionaries running around. And so they're trying to solve problems that shouldn't be solved. And what I mean by that is fixing the way they did something five years ago is a waste of everybody's time. Figure Mm -hmm. out how to do something new five years from now that doesn't require all that all that work. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to have to be aware that the business leaders are going to tell you to solve problems that, you know, as I call looking in the rearview mirror. I don't care what happened in the rearview mirror. Taking yeah. technology and making it make new things possible is what you want to do. And the other thing that I learned the mm-hmm. hard way is uh, some shibboleths <laughs> aren't made to be torn down. Some yeah. things exist because, you know, if, if uh, I remember once I did something that, that actually blew up an entire department that was turned out to be unnecessary and it could be automated away with a simple script. And, exactly. Um, But now the department exists and they don't want to give up their turf. They don't want to give up their turf and the manager didn't want to give up the headcount. And, oh, my Lord, it was (laughs) 
or something. So just watch out for the landmines inside of organizations like that where that well, sort of thing and, does happen. And speaking of landmines, uh, you know, you raised when we were talking about this, you raised a really good point, which mm. is why is this even necessary? Why is this IT's job yeah. to invest headcount in this, to go do these jobs, to go blah, blah, blah? Why can't business integrate with IT functions? Um, and what you'll see is that fully digitally transformed companies, there's my corpo speak for the day, <laughs> fully digitally transformed companies operate that way Yeah, because they recognize the importance of IT. So, and yeah. very, very technical companies operate that way. Yeah. But ordinary companies still think of IT as a function up there with, you know, facilities that like, yeah, you keep the lights on and the computer's running, but you're not, you don't really help me do business. And so the reality is, unless you're lucky enough to live in a comp- work in a company that actually recognizes the value of technology, mm-hmm. you're stuck with it. So yeah, it reminds me of many, many years ago when I was chief technology officer for a, a mostly male, mostly techie organization. I hired an executive coach because this problem of communicating with the business was so difficult because I was the only techie and the only woman in senior management. Mm. And one of the questions she asked me was, well, when you do work, do you keep your door door to your office open or closed? And I looked at her like she grown three heads and said closed so I can get work done and she said see that's the problem people expect women to be accessible so you should keep your door open I Mm. said well that's their problem because those are their expectations why should I have to change me to their expectations and she said Jonna look around you (laughs) you are working in a male environment you have to acknowledge and work with those expectations fighting with what's in fighting we talked about that in a a show recently about branding and personal branding and you have to be aware of how your brand presents, regardless of how you think it presents or how you might want Exa- to present it. Doesn't, exactly. Yeah. 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 And and honestly, Greg, well, before we wrap up, I just want to say uh, I, I was reading an article where somebody was complaining about the fact that he liked to show up to every social event in flip-flop shorts and T-shirts because that's just who he is. Yeah. And I remember thinking, God, that person really needs to listen to Greg on branding. <laughs> You can do that, but I'm never going to take you seriously when you look like that until proven otherwise. But even so, you know. Well, on that note, we have to wrap up today's show. Thanks so much to Jonah. Jonah, where can people find you? Come visit us at nemertes.com and click on the link that says community. Join our community. Greg and I hang out there. And the as these get posted, they show up in the community. And we will happily answer your questions and dis- discuss this and many other topics. Although we talked about a lot of things, I think we've left more questions unanswered than we actually have answered. Um, we haven't uh, tried to leave this, but it's just sort of a way to open up a discussion. And that's the format of Heavy Strategy. As always, you can find more information over on the Packet Pushers podcast network. Just type packet pushes into your podcatcher and you'll be able to find lots more podcasts on technology that fit into your start lifestyle maybe into your technology stack as uh if you've got any follow-up or you want to get feedback to us or you want to propose a topic please head over to packetpushers.net slash fu where you can send us your follow-up completely anonymous we don't need to know who you are if you don't want to that's absolutely fine and uh if you've been listening we'll look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks